You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcast on the European Pillar of Social Rights for a More Social Europe. Economic growth or people? Actually, what about economic growth and people? Finding a balance between the economic and social aspects of the European project in general and of the EU's Economic and Monetary Union in particular is the main aim of the European Pillar of Social Rights recently outlined by the European Commission. Want to know more? Stay with us and we'll walk you through the details. In the context of austerity and fragile economic recovery, the call for a more social Europe is getting louder and louder. The European Parliament has long pushed for higher European social standards, while the Commission's President, Jean-Claude Juncker, has said he wants Europe to earn a social AAA. To achieve this, he wants to develop European tools and policies to ensure upward social convergence, to strengthen the social dimension of the economic and monetary union. That means equal opportunities and access to the labour market, social protection, fair working conditions and many other things like the creation of a social protection floor that defines a set of basic social security guarantees that ensure that all in need have access throughout their lives to essential health care and basic income security. The Commission's latest major initiative towards this objective is the so-called European Pillar of Social Rights. But what is this about? Well, in March 2016, the Commission published a preliminary outline of the pillar, together with a compilation of the existing EU social key, information on key economic, employment and social trends, and a progress assessment towards key structural reforms within the 2016 European semester. The Commission proposal puts on the table all the major issues that might be relevant to guarantee EU citizens access to fair labour markets and welfare systems. It calls in broad terms for investment in human capital, the renewal of the flex security agenda and a serious reflection on public finances, of which welfare systems take up a large share. It includes 20 principles within three main areas equal opportunities and access to the labour market, including skills development, lifelong learning and active support for employment, fair working conditions to facilitate job creation and promote social dialogue, and adequate and sustainable social protection, including childcare, healthcare and long-term care. It's based on the EU's social acquis, and once established, it could become a European reference framework for monitoring and benchmarking. But would its provisions be binding? Well, while employment policy remains in the hands of the member states, the EU's legal framework allows for binding and non-binding recommendations in order to guarantee the free movement of workers. And in the social field, some degree of harmonisation towards setting minimum standards is possible. So the answer is yes, the new social pillar could become a binding instrument. The social pillar outline taps into several discussions, old and new, on addressing inequality, ensuring sustainability and fostering social investment and social justice. And a number of trends need to be taken into account. For example, increasing social and cultural diversity, rising levels of inequality with simultaneous skills mismatches, digitization and connectedness, different definitions of work and attitudes towards it, changing family structures and longer life expectancy. So the pillar outline calls for a more holistic approach, building on new knowledge about the relationship between economic and social performance to find a better balance between the financial and social aspects of the economic and monetary union. In this sense, the pillar outline makes a clear case for the usefulness of linking social and employment issues to broader macroeconomic policies. The truth is that fiscal consolidation through drastic cuts in public investment has been a common response during the crisis, while little attention has been paid to the social costs. But a recent study suggests that placing a stronger focus on employment and social issues in the macroeconomic surveillance process would give a more accurate picture of each country's conditions and might in turn help to develop more efficient policies and strategies. So could the new social pillar be the answer? It's difficult to say at this stage, but what's clear is that a greater socialisation of Europe's governance, more attention to inclusion, social security and protection are not new ideas in the European policy landscape. Let's review some recent history. In fact, in recent years, there have been many initiatives in this direction. The 2008 Recommendation on Active Inclusion, the 2013 Social Investment Package, including a recommendation on investing in children, and many recent initiatives to improve the employment and social situation across the EU. 
In 2013, following up on its blueprint for a deep and genuine economic and monetary union, the Commission set itself the objective of strengthening the social dimension of the EMU. It suggested, for example, using appropriate employment and social indicators within the European Semester Framework and reinforcing the surveillance of employment and social challenges within the framework of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure. So it's in this context that a first outline of the pillar was published in March 2016 and is open to public consultation with social partners, civil society, national parliaments and many other actors to the end of the year. So what are their views so far? Well, it didn't take long for the first comments to arrive, but given the broadness of the proposal, the expectations concerning the final content and form of the pillar are very diverse. The Tripartite Social Summit, for example, emphasised the importance of strengthening the social dialogue, and in a common statement by the Dutch Council Presidency, the European Commission and the social partners from late June, the need to strengthen social dialogue within economic governance and the European semester was laid down on paper. In a similar vein, the first annual Convention on Inclusive Growth concluded that civil society should be actively involved in the design of the pillar and the European Anti-Poverty Network called for focusing on the implementation of reforms in the pillar outline and the inclusion of the poorest citizens among the target groups these reforms will seek to address. Some other stakeholders called for concrete measures or even quantitative and qualitative targets in terms of work-life balance, skills development, minimum income and wage and unemployment benefit. Others stressed that the main emphasis of the pillar should not be on social rights but on structural reforms that boost productivity, competitiveness and thereby help create new jobs, which in turn will help to address social challenges. Finally, several voices, including that of the European Parliament, have questioned whether the pillar would really be able to deliver upward convergence rather than provoke a race to the bottom, since it is mainly focused on the euro area. It could also foster a two-speed Europe. And since its legal basis is unclear and it focuses only on individual social rights, it might not serve as an effective counterbalance to the strong focus the EU seems to place on economic issues at present. The European Parliament will play a big role in shaping the final form of the social pillar. With its increasing involvement in the EMU mechanism, the Parliament has already called for a social pact to promote youth employment and decent living standards, a social protection floor to guarantee universal access to essential health, European standards to manage restructuring in a social and responsible way, and equal pay and equal rights for equal work, amongst other measures. Since 2012, several Parliament resolutions have called for the socialisation of the EMU. MEPs have also asked the Commission to think of the social consequences before imposing major reforms in programme countries such as Greece. A large majority of MEPs also agree with the necessity to increase the convergence of social systems across the EU to reinforce the European social model, with some members calling for the introduction of instruments such as a minimum wage and unemployment insurance. So how will the final form of the Pillar of Social Rights look? Well, for as long as its contents are not clear, the format will also remain open. It could be a commission recommendation, it could be a new piece of legislation, and or be an instrument for defining more pertinent country-specific recommendations within the European semester. But whatever the format, what seems clear is that it should be binding. At first, it would only apply to the Euro area countries, but afterwards it could also be applied to other member states. Once established, it could become the reference framework to review employment and social performance, to drive national reforms and to serve as a compass for the renewed process of convergence within the Euro area and beyond. These are ambitious objectives in current times, but will the pillar be robust enough to hold firm? Will it really help reshape the welfare state so that it's fit for purpose and frames a more inclusive and equal Europe? We'll keep an eye on developments. You're listening to the European Parliamentary Research Service Podcasts.